G'day everybody and welcome to Dog Shadow Gaming, the channel where we live to game and game to live. As always, I'm Belf and joining me today is Beast. Do you want to say hello there, Beast? Hello everyone. Uh, for another episode of uh, training new players on how to play Warhammer Turtle War. Uh, but we'll be right back after this. <laughs> Okay, and we're back. Uh, so, in our last episode, episode two, we're now into episode three, um, Beast had just taken a couple of points in the Silver Road. I think he had just completed the Silver... Silver Road. Yes, he's completed the Silver Road. And he turned the turn timer. It was now on to myself. Uh, in our previous one, I had taken over Karag Bufthor, and now I'll be heading down to Zark Zeal. Uh, we do need to um, get our public order going. Income from settlement buildings. We'll go to that one first, then we'll head down to public order. Um, now, continue on with uh, teaching new players how to play. Uh, just with the with the the skills tree, yeah, or your technology tree that you've got to go through. Um, when playing the dwarves, I highly recommend. I think I said this in the last time to go through the top layer first um, this will help you get the money you need to keep your armies going if you go straight into the armies and you can do this what you tend to find is you start running out of cash and you can't sustain decent enough army so it tends to be for dwarves just while we're on them to go this way i strongly recommend that you go guild relations and then dwarven diplomats and the reason for this is if you have a read here it says diplomatic relations plus 10 with factions human high elves and lizardmen but the next one is Diplomatic Relations plus 20 with Factions, Human, High Elves, and Lizardmen. This means that you can get a lot of um, trade deals and diplomatic actions and um, military alliances very, very quickly and very, very easily. It's also really, really, really good for um, finding yourself in better steam with other doors. The other doors will tend to... Be quite favorable towards you anyway except for maybe Karakun. generally they're a pain in the bum but generally the rest will be fine this helps you to get all the other alliances and trade that you need to buff your army for gold so i would definitely go down to there um and then i would depending on hero cost that's a good one i would definitely be going up to toolmaker's trades and then i would go into military um, training and and then into your more military side of things but just something quickly while we're doing the dwarves uh right so i will move my turn fairly quickly we in our first episode um we went through the ui and the second we went through more battles so this one we're just going to continue along we've already discussed ui so i'm not going to go too much more into that what are we at? 430. We're going to move down here. We're going to open up our diplomacy here and just have a quick look and see what we've got. Do we have an ability to trade with anybody yet? We can trade with Tilia. Let's have a look. They probably won't. Tilia and Astalia are typically pains in the bum to try and get to as far as um, getting alliances and that sort of thing with them. And now, uh, some things to note here. If, the, if it is red, the likelihood is low. If it is yellow, so if you're looking at, at your diplomatic um, tree and you open up on someone and you go in that says non-aggression, trade agreement, military access, defensive alliance, military alliance. Now, non, uh, break non-aggression pact and break military access pact because we already have those with them, right? Payments where you can either demand a payment or give payments to give them gifts so they might like you. You can join a war. Um, or you can declare war on them, right? Now, what what is usually the easiest to get is the non-aggression. Now, if this is if this is red, there's very little to. I mean, don't even bother. You're not going to get it, right? If it's yellow, they are amenable to it. You might have to bribe them a little bit with payments, or they might end up coming to green on their own if you leave it for long enough. Um, if it's green, then you've got a, a a likelihood of getting it. If it's super like a real bright green, like there's a light green and then there's a darker green. The darker the green, the more they like you. The lighter the green going to yellow, 
the less they like you. So think of it that way. So you got you got red, they don't like you. Yellow, they're okay. Light green, they're liking you. Dark green, they're really liking you. Okay, and that's how it works. When we look, uh, if I go back out of here, and when we look down the side here, you can see. So we've got orange here, which means they're neutral. They don't care either way. Green, they're friendly. And let's see if we can find a dark green. So neutral, they're neutral, they're friendly, they're not neutral, but they're not super friendly yet. Um, trusted friends, you see how it says down the bottom there? We're trusted friends. Now this is, whenever you do a co-op, basically what that means is, sorry, well I just adjust my seat. Um, what this means is, you can see how it's a slightly different shade of green, it's a little bit darker than this green here. Um, we have the military alliance. When you start as a co-op with somebody, you automatically have a military alliance. We have military access, which means we can come and go out of their, their um, controlled areas without incurring any diplomatic problems. So if you just like roll into somebody else's um, territory without asking them first or without getting a military access, you'll get a, a debuff or they'll, they'll not like you. If we scroll over the little face, we can see down the side here that um, the reasons why they like us basically or don't like us so in this case treaties with dwarves 55 points for that and then we're at war with the green skin so we get an extra 13 points we're at war with crooked moon and so on and so forth and so on and then it adds it all up in the end and it shows you where you're going so we're improving if we go and have a look at barrack var we're also improving there and for those reasons as you can see listed now if we go to the gray prospectors we started at neutral and we're getting more Let's try and find someone who's, and they're all dwarves, so you're going to mostly approve of them. So let's look at the beastmen. Beastmen don't like us, right? Um, things they do approve of, war with a broken nose. They do approve of that. But they have an aversion to us because we're dwarves, and so we're order aligned and they're not. They're chaos aligned. So there's a massive aversion straight off the bat. We have a treaty with the dwarves, who, the, who treaties with dwarves, who, we don't, who they don't like. So that's a minus 17. And they don't like the empire, so that's another minus 12. So you can see how that system works, yeah? Just because you ally with one may have consequences on another. And that is pretty, it's pretty, you, you need to notice that because these guys will just start wars on you all of a sudden. Quick question. Yep. Is there anyone you don't want to go to war with? Like someone that's just, do you got to start? go to war with straight away well this at times race? well here's the thing beast at times there will be there'll always be someone you don't want to go to war with and, and you got to think about this you don't just want to go to war with everybody because then you'll get attacked no, on all no, fronts no, 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 no. right so it's just like if you're running a proper kingdom you don't want to be at war with all of your neighbors because they're just going to gang up on you yeah so you've got to be a bit diplomatic here and make sure you don't end up in a war with too many people all at once because you're just going to get bombarded and taken out um usually yeah, the rule that. Usually the rule for a new player, I would say, is try not to be at war with any more than two or three factions, three at the most for a new player. Um, there is some things you're not going to be able to, you know, you're not going to be able to do anything about, right? So um, where, where are the dwarves? So we're, we're sworn enemies of the orcs. So we're not, they don't like us. Straight off the bat, they don't like us, right? We're not at war with all of them, but eventually we probably will be, right? So, but just remember that, you know, you're going to be at war with them. Do you necessarily want to be going to war with Clan Scryer right now? Well, probably not. Do you know what I mean? Because you're already going to have a war. Now, something else that we can look at here is if you have a look down here or up the top, it shows you the race, the name, the strength of that faction, the settlement, uh, settlement, tr settlements they have, treaties that we have with them, the war target. So if you have a vassal or a military alliance with somebody, you can set a target for them to go after. Can you trade with them or not? If you can see how this one says cannot trade and it's got a little cross through it, that means you can't trade with them. They're either landlocked too far away from you or you don't have a port or something of that nature. Um, if it's open like this, it means you are able to trade, but then you've got to try and organize a trade agreement with them. If it, And then we've got the face we already talked about. So this is the diplomatic bar and what it basically does. Down the bottom here is if you have an alliance with somebody and they're at war with the same people you're at war with, you can actually set a target for them to attack. Now, remember, it's the PC, so it may choose to or may choose not to actually attack that target. Generally, it will if you've got a good, strong alliance with them and they like you. Um, there are some factions that will just immediately dislike you and it'll be very, very, very tough for you to get them to like you. Cool. All right, so that's the diplomatic um, panel. I'll do another panel on the next one.
Uh, what have we got in the book of grudges? Uh, seen as an oath unfulfilled and a sore point for all dwarves, the loss of Karak Eight Peaks was a low point for the Paras and Kor. And Kor, since it has fallen, since its fall, many dwarves have tried and failed to reconquer it. Velaga is the latest of those who has dedicated his life to reclaiming the famous hold as a direct descendant of the last ruler of Karak Eight Peaks. Belagar and all those in Lan Ungren, I think, consider. Oh, Clan, sorry, it was Clan Ungren. Consider its occupation their greatest grudge. Right, so that's our overall, as we talked about earlier. Um, that's probably about it for my turn. I'm going to head down here. We're going to be taking this guy out. I'm going to have a quick look at his army. He's only got three in here, which is cool. Let's have a quick look at his garrison. So. And he's got a small garrison. So we should be able to beat that in our next turn. We should get there all the turn after that. So we'll get there. Okay, so let's over to Bell, uh, Beast and uh, see what he's got to do. Here we go. My army's nice and healthy. That's good. Okay. Now, you should be getting your first um, quest mission pretty soon. And mm. it will end up coming to you up here. Now, what the, through the game, um, characters will get quest missions. So main storyline characters, or main characters, main generals you choose to play in the any of the campaigns they come with storyline missions that'll pop up from time to time. And this is where you will get your purple weapons from, your, your epic weapons for that general. He needs to go earn them. And what it'll be is it'll be a, a set battle. It'll have a cinematic trailer start. Um, and it'll be a tough one. So just make sure that you're ready to fight it. And you're pretty good before you do fight it. But that'll be coming up soon. Probably, if not this turn, it'll probably be in about a turn or two turns max. All right, Beast, what are you going to do? I don't know. Okay, well, do you have I'm anything sure. that you need to build? I'm in my technology tree at the moment. Now, I've clicked on one. Yep. But it's telling me I've got more to choose from. Are you going into your technology tree? You can only you can only pick one at a time. I did that before when you were talking, and it keeps telling me, keeps taking me back. Oh, you! I don't think you'd be able to. I don't think you're able to pick there a wall in co-op. Yeah. I just picked the same thing again. I've got my intern back now. Okay. So you're just recruiting troops there? Recruited a couple, yeah. Cool, all right. So what else do we need to discuss? I think we've gone through most of the UI now and what things mean. So if you look up here and you can see um, the Ungren's flag, right? So this is this his... Um, Karaz or Karak, uh, the clan uh, is uh, Thorgrim Grudgebearers, right? Not sure what his clan is, actually. Anyway, um, if you have a look on the flag, you can see there's like a hand with two swords in it. This means that we have a military alliance with this particular faction. So other factions always show up with things if you've got some sort of deal with them. Um, you can see that we have a military alliance, but we also have um, access you, you get that automatically with a military license. There's nothing higher that you can get with another faction um, other than military alliance, unless you are of the same race, then you can um, confederate with them, which means that you can offer them to join your faction. And they have to like you quite a bit or be like getting smashed by somebody else. And then they sometimes will. Except for the vampires, they're a pain in the bum and really hard to get to confederate. You can do it, but they're painful. The dwarves are probably the most easiest faction to confederate with. 
uh probably i'd say dwarves then humans and then high elves is probably the next one i'd say that the hardest one i've found to get to confederate is uh norska or vampires vampires vampire is probably the hardest okay i just got a diplomacy thing come up yep so what does karag azul want okay so how do the plans use their demands they want a hundred gold payment their offers join war against uh an enemy we're both fighting by the looks of it Okay, but you won't already be at war with this guy. So you've got to think about that. He's offered you 100 gold. He'll give you 100 gold if you join a war for him. Now, generally speaking... No, most... that's their demands. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Oh. Yeah. So um, you don't need to join the war with him. Yeah? You might give him a slight political myth, but it's not massive. So don't necessarily, you don't necessarily want to join wars unless you want to fight them. So you make sure you're ready and you want to fight that war before you accept that offer. Quite it's often. too early for this. Huh? Yeah. Too early for this. So I'd probably go, no, not interested in your war right now. You will already be at war with, um, with the bloody spears. And the red fangs. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. So you don't need to get more, get into more wars just yet. Yeah, not yet. Not until I get a bigger army. So how much will that negative my ally? Probably not a lot for that sort of stuff, even if it does at all. Um, he'll ask again, more than likely. Faction already destroyed. That's interesting. Oh, Karakun got in there and did it quickly. Fair enough. Okay. Let's see. Yeah, Daddy will. All right. Uh, now, quickly, what should we have a look at this time? We've, went in, we've gone into this. We've gone into diplomacy. We went into objectives. I don't think there's a lot else to go into at this point, so we'll just keep moving through the campaign. Uh, yeah, back to you. So did you get a oh, chance wow. to play the game today, Beast? Since last we no. recorded? No, I thought I'd wait till you come on because I'm still getting the hang of it. Yeah, you're right, mate. No problem at all. Okay, so what are you up to? What are you doing in your this turn? Yep, I'm having a It's still telling me I got technology to do, but I keep clicking on the same thing, but I don't get that. Well, well click on technology. They have, of course. Right. So there'll be one, they'll have little, it'll be the ones that are highlighted, not the ones that are not highlighted. Can't use the ones that are not highlighted. And it'll be ones that already have, that have like a little time glass above the right hand side. Those yep. are the ones you can pick. So pick one of them, just click on it. And it should, the time glass should go. Um... Time glass should go. Mm. Or it should be. No. Hang on. Oh, it'll be highlighted. So the ones you've already completed will remain highlighted, like highlighted, highlighted. Yes. And then the current yes, one you're yes. doing will be flashing highlighted. Yeah, it's flashing. Okay, there you go. Now you're done. All right. Click OK. Quite. I can build more stuff. Oh, I've got a lot of building, actually. Hmm. Okay. Um, You've got... All right, so you've got three Dwarven Warriors in your front line. Plus the hammerer, who's more of a support back uh, midline. Uh, you've got the miner, who's kind of uh, scoutish, I suppose you'd call him. And then you've got two quarrelers and the grudge thrower. I would recommend if you. I don't know if you can do it yet, can you? You can. Once you upgrade your sparring chamber, 
So, okay, if you have a look at your Silver Road right now, Beast. Yes. If you notice, you'll have, you have two of the same building that you don't actually need, right? So if you look I at don't. Mount Squeakhorn and then you look at Karak, Karaz Akarak, you've got two of the sparring chamber. Yes, yes, in, I see that. In the, same, in the same province, which you don't actually need, right? Because this particular um, building, you only need one of. Yeah. I didn't build that second one. That was already there. Exactly. But here's, so if you click on that um, building, what you'll see is that it only goes up to level three, right? Yep. So with that, you want to get that one up pretty quick. So your main settlement, if you have a look at Karazakarak, it actually goes up to like, I think it's level six. Yeah. So you don't necessarily want to put a building in there that only goes to level three, because then you'll be taking up a slot that other buildings that need that go up to four and five and six could be in, right? If you yes. have a look at Mount Squeakhorn, the main base, the dwarf mining colony, only goes to level three. So you only want to put things in there that will go to level three or below level three. If you put something that goes to level four, you'll never be able to build it to its full extent. Does that make sense? Mm, yes, it does. So when, you, when you're looking at your main, every time you get a province, there'll always be a main settlement and then little settlements, right, along with it. Sometimes it'll be one main settlement and two little settlements like this one. Sometimes it'll be four. Sometimes it'll be one. That all changes, but there's always a main settlement. Now, how many slots in that main settlement will change? This is, this is pretty much the stronghold for the dwarves. So you can see that you've got alongside your Karo's Arkarak outpost, You've got another two, four, six, eight, nine different slots you can use in that that post, right? Yes. However, you don't right now. You can only because you're at level two on your post. Excuse me, I itch my ear a little bit. Um, you don't want to waste that position using it on something that eventually you're going to be wanting to put in Mount Squeakhorn or the Pillars of Grungi, right? So what I would do if I were you is get rid of the sparring chamber that's in Karaz Akarak and just keep it in Mount Squeakhorn. Keep it in the lower one. Correct. And the reason for this is simple. It's fairly cheap to build, right? So it's not really expensive. So it doesn't need as much defense. So let's talk about, we'll talk about building in the next one that I, that I do, right? And when my turn's there. But basically with building, you you want to make sure whatever your main settlement is, once that's fully upgraded, each time you upgrade it, if you have a if you mouse over Karaza Karak, you'll see on the left hand uh -huh. side that the income for this particular building is at 150. It provides two plus two public order, improves tower projectile bullets, growth plus twenty, income from all buildings plus thirty-five in regions in this province, income from all buildings plus eighteen in all adjacent regions, grants four construction slots in the settlement, provides a garrison of one grudge shower, two hammerers, three longbeards, three miners, three quarrelers, and two thunderers. Now, what that means is if somebody attacks that, that, that settlement right now, that's what will be protecting it. You, that's the army you'll get, right? And that army doesn't cost you anything. It's, it's there. It's part of the settlement, right? Mm -hmm. Each time you upgrade that, you'll get more people to protect your settlement. The, the benefits and bonuses will go up and up and up and up and up and up. Does that make sense? So yes. in, the little, in the little one, like say if you go back over to Mount Squeakhorn, you have a look at that, the income generated from it is 80. The growth is plus five. It grants one construction slot in the settlement and you get dwarf warriors and miners to protect it. So it's not as well protected, yeah? So you don't necessarily want to put something that's going to cost a lot of money in there. Now, even that's at rank one. So if you have a look at the, the dwarf colony, it's got a little one next to it on the bottom left-hand corner. That means it's in rank one. It goes to a maximum of rank three, right? So again, it's not going to ever be a, a big settlement. So you're better off putting small things in there that don't cost as much in case it does get taken out by an enemy and leave your most expensive things and things that have to go up to higher levels in your main settlements. Mm, yeah, that makes sense. Okay. 
Um, I've got quite a bit of construction here. I've got construction on all of them I can do. Right. So what I would do is, number one, if you click on Sparring Chamber on um, in Karazakarak, you can actually destruct, um, destroy Already. the Sparring Chamber. Yeah, so get rid of that. That'll open you up a slot to put something better in there, right? Um, if you can upgrade Karazakarak, I suggest you do that with haste. Because no, the, I can't upgrade that yet. That's that'll not take time. So after a certain amount of times, every turn you build a surplus of um, what do they call it? Um, surplus of uh, the, the, <laughs> I can't think of the word. All of a sudden, my brain's frozen. Basically, you build up um people in your your bar, in your settlements, and once you get to enough people or population, that's what I'm looking for. Once you get to enough population, you'll be eligible to upgrade that. My, right now, I would guess you can upgrade the Dwarf Mining Colony and the Pillars of Grungi to the next level. Is that correct? <laughs> no, Please? I have yep. Gem Mine, Open Construction, Open Construction in Karaza Karaza. Correct. I haven't got oh, them yet. Okay, you've got the two extra points. Okay. So you can upgrade the gem mine, which will give you, if you have a look at it, I think it jumps you to 600 income rather than 300 income. I've got that going already, yeah. All right, so that's good. That's an income, so you want to do that pretty quickly. Now what I would do is I'd have a look in your different options that you can build in those two beside you and have a look for stuff that, ha that, that is going to go above through the third tier. So you might find that... Um, if you go into military, there will be a um, there'll be like an archer symbol or a gun symbol. That's your that's your um, ranged uh, barracks. So that go that starts at level two, I believe, and and then goes up to like level four. So that's one that you'll probably want to put in. But I wouldn't start necessarily with that. You if you go into your th the fourth tab on the right, the green tab. This is all your economic buildings. And in that economic buildings, you'll see a picture of a barrel, like a beer barrel or a keg. You want to click on that one because that will start to give you growth and it'll also help you to keep the peace, basically. It'll give you stability. Did you find it? No, I'm looking through it. I see all my provinces, I see what I got to do, but those buttons you told me about, I just don't see. Okay, well, you might not have the cash for it yet, mate. They might be greyed out because you don't no, have the money for I... it. Anything they can build with a keg. So when you click on it, when you click on the, the open construction slot, a menu will pop up. On the far right is the economic building, so it'll be green. Yeah. Now, if you don't have the money for something or they're all of that, there's no, you don't have enough money for anything in that particular category, it will be gray out just saying that you don't have the cash for it, but you should definitely have the cash for it. Yeah, I, I think. think I do. Yeah. What I got here, I can upgrade Mount Squighorn and the Pillars of Grundy to level two already. I, should I do that? I would do that then. Yeah. The quicker you get them up, the more defensible they are and the more income they start making you. So if you look at okay. your if you look at it currently and then you look at the next step, it'll actually tell you how it will upgrade. Sure did. Okay. Yep. Cool. All right. Now what are you that's gonna it. do? That's, next? that's everything I can do. Are you still recruiting? It looks like you are from what I can see. Yeah, I've, I've recruited a couple more. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right. Well then turn the turn and We'll keep moving on. All right. So that's something to to consider. You you want to be very careful about how you build. It's one of the. It's another pitfall that new character, uh, new players, tend to make mistakes with. Uh, yeah, we'll take a non-aggression. That's fine. We don't really want to fight with the wood elves. Um, so basically, this can be really costly. So try to think ahead 
when you're building in your settlements, really do try to think ahead of what you are going to build. Don't just think, okay, well, I need to build this right away because I'm going to get some cash out of it or I really want that particular unit, so I'm going to build it straight up. Try to think of your, your placement in your, in your, as a province rather than just a particular... Um, uh, oh, they're asking me to join them in war again. Well, let's just say no. It's fine. Um, 300 now. Uh, it, it's up to you. If it's another orc tribe, you could just say yes. You're going to be at war with them again anyway, or you can just wait and they might offer you more again. They want me to fight the Dawi. Who? Barak Var wants you to fight Dawi. Oh, no, I've got to fight with the D A W I. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. Their demands is defensive alliance. Their offers is 300 gold. Okay, so they're offering an alliance with you. They want to get a defensive alliance. Now, let's talk really quickly about defensive and military alliances. There are two types of alliances, and then there is also a non-aggression pack. Now, the non-aggression pack is the first one that we saw, and this basically says you're not going to attack each other. The, you know, And in order, this keeps going until one of you decides to break that. And that doesn't mean break that as in you deliberately jump on one of their settlements and start attacking them. Um, if you do that, you'll get a negative to your diplomatic relations with everybody else on the map. And like everybody doesn't like it, right? And that'll last for like 11 or 12 turns. So it'll be very hard for you to get any anything diplomatic done because you broke a diplomatic agreement. Now, if you just break the agreement and then you don't attack them straight away, you give it a turn, um, then it's not so bad. It's okay, well, you've just you've broken the, the non-agreement, but you haven't attacked them. Um, the next one is a defensive alliance. Now, a defensive alliance is really simple. You agree with this person that if somebody attacks them, that you will come and defend, you will come and help them to defend themselves. It's not, it does not mean that if they attack somebody else that you have to get involved. And it also doesn't mean that you'll be getting involved with any war they already have going. Only any war that happens from that point onwards, if they're attacked, it'll come up with that your ally has been attacked by one of these guys. Do you choose to jump in and help him out? Yeah. Now, if you choose not to, you break the all alliances because you had an alliance saying you would help them. A military alliance is the strongest kind of alliance. This is, this is the highest form of alliance outside of a vassal. Um, and we'll talk about vassals in a second. And a military alliance is that if you attack someone, they have to come and join, right? If somebody attacks you, they have to come and join. Vice versa. If they decide to attack someone, you have to come and join. Um, you aren't pulled into any war that they're currently in, only anybody, any war that starts with them from that point on. So if they're already at war with a particular orc faction, it doesn't immediately drag you into war with them. Um, Oh, hang on. I might be incorrect there. I think it I think it maybe it does bring you into war with them. It does. Sorry. Military alliance is 100%. Any war they're involved in, you'll be involved in, and that's that. Defensive alliance is a bit different. Uh, then the last one is vassal. Now, vassal is... Um, they're your vassal. They can't militarily attack anybody unless you tell them they can, and they have to pay you a certain amount of money, and on top of that... Uh, they they have to join you in any wars that you start. Now, if they choose not to join you in any war, they break their vassalage and you can then attack them. Um, vice versa, they can break their own vassalage. It can happen um, if they think they're stronger than you or they can get away with it, basically. Uh, vassalage is very unreliable. So uh, I would definitely enter a defensive alliance with Barak Var. They're another dwarven nation. So yeah, um, defensive sounds like it's more better. I only have to defend them if they get attacked. In their if they get attacked, yeah, they'll, you'll get dragged into. That would be good. Yeah, okay, I agree to it. Now, also as you as you keep going, like you get a non-aggression pack, then you get a defensive pack, and then you get a military alliance with somebody. They'll start liking you more and more and more and more and more. Now, in Beast's case, where he's got Barak Var, Barak Var actually joins his land, right? So Barak Var is actually really good for the dwarves because if you can confederate these guys, they normally get hard, pretty hard pressed pretty straight up by the orcs. If you can confederate them, you immediately get a port and a harbor out of Barak Var itself, which has a harbor on it. This means you have access, <clears throat> pardon me. This means you have access all the way to the sea and you then can trade with everybody on the map who has a port, basically. 
So this is really good for the dwarves who have very high diplomatic relationships with most other, well, at least order or even neutral aligned um, races. Um, and they can make a lot of money out of trade, which is really good. And the more you trade with somebody, the more they like you, the less likely they are to attack you and vice versa and so on and so on. So um, getting a defensive alliance is a, a very uh, important part of the diplomacy of Total War Warhammer. The diplomacy thing just came up again. Says their demands defensive alliance, their office defensive alliance. Is this just the second part to it that I have to agree to? Same people? Yeah. Uh, Did, is it Barak Var, the purple banner with the little mountain on it? That's someone else. Okay, who is it? Brandon Stoneheart. Yeah, Broad what's the... Brandon Stoneheart. What's the flag? Uh, it's like a blue flag with like... I don't know what the hell we call that thing in the middle of it. Like a hammer? Oh, it's like a two triangles and some sort of structure in the middle of it. Okay, so Zufbar is just above you and they're, they are a um, dwarf faction as well. And they're asking you for a defensive alliance as well. So I would definitely do that. Two straight up. Oh, okay. Well, they're they're both dwarven factions, and they both they're both ally. They're both dwarven, so they're both the same race, and they both join your. They're both next to your um, lands, right? Mm. So yeah. um, it's okay. usually not a bad problem to get defensive and military alliances with the people factions of your own race. Generally speaking, that's pretty good because eventually, mate, what you can do is confederate with them and then you take all of their armies and all their lands. Oh. But you also take all their debt, so you've got to be very careful. Yeah, <laughs> okay. yeah so, there's a trade-off. Although, yeah. although it's cool and you're like, oh, yeah, sweet, I'm going to get all his, you know, if I if I um, confederate with Barak Var, then I'll get Barak Var and I'll get Var Var Varanek heels, right? Varanecker heels. However, what you need to remember is that they already have an army. So, and the, and the computer cheats a little bit. Like, it'll have an army that, that you can't actually support with the um, lands that it has. Does that make sense? So you'll inherit this army all of a sudden and go, holy hell, my, uh, my income's, like, in the red because <laughs> you're paying out for this army and you'll have to disassemble, dis disassemble the army very, very quickly to save yourself from going to bankruptcy. So just something to be aware of. But generally, confederating people is a good thing. Okay, let's have a, our first battle of the um, episode. I hmm. some people saying, finally. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, these are the things. Like, these are the things that you don't know at first. They don't, like, um, it's not necessarily. Yeah, I know. If you hadn't told me all this, I would have made a lot of mistakes. Okay, you need to press. Ooh, um, quite a bit. Need to press spectator. Done. Right. So, um, well, it's a lot to take in at first, and one of the, and a lot of new players make mistakes just because you just don't have any clue what you're doing, and you're trying to work your way through it, and this can be really frustrating um, for people. Um, and it makes the game seem a lot harder than it is. It's just a matter of understanding how the diplomacy system works. Um, yeah, and once you get the hang of it, you're kind of like, oh, I see, and you know, that's how you do it. We're about to release, I think in two or three months, Three Kingdoms, which is based off the old um, uh, Dynasty Warriors, uh, Three Kingdoms saga. Ooh. Oh, it's not based off Dynasty Warriors as such. It's in the same time period as Dynasty Warriors, which is the fantasy version of the three kingdoms period in china um so that's going to be pretty interesting because they've uh they've just released new footage of or uh, ca's just released new footage of the diplomacy system for that game it's another total war but it's just not set in the warhammer um uh, ip that this one is so that's going to be really interesting and it's it's They've got some pretty cool mechanics in it so far. Okay, so I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you the archers in this one, and I'm going to give you my vanguard, right? Yep. Okay. 
Okay, so they're all yours now. Um, so let's have a quick look at the map. Always start your battle off before you press that start button. Have a look at the map. No, not like that. That's another, you, if you press tab, you can, you can sort of do a bird's eye view on things. Um, I've never played like this. It's not really my sort of thing. I'd always go off like this. Now, first thing we want to have a look at is, as I said in the last one, you want to look at the high grounds, right? You want to try and get archers on high grounds. If you can get them to charge you up a hill, this is always a positive. Um, you also want to look at high grounds for things like your um, artillery pieces. Some artillery pieces will shoot into the back of your troops if they're too close or they don't have line of sight. You can also have a look and see where there's opportunities for ambushes with forested areas and things like that. Um, we have vanguard units, so there's opportunity, as we talked about in the last episode, to maybe hide up in a corner here if there's some forest area. If you do sit up here and you're not in a forested area and your units don't have a, like a chameleon ability, um, then you will be seen and taken out. So be careful on that. Just make sure you're putting the right units up there if you're going to do that. Um, if we have a look at this really quickly, we can see that they have like a tufted hill here, which would be nice to set archers on. The only thing is we're the aggressor here. We're attacking them. So they will come at us because they're orcs, right? But um, sometimes you might have to be the aggressor in this one. Anyway, what we're going to do is we're going to pull out here from behind there. I'm going to pull over here, grab my guys, whack them here. Thanes on the outside. Remember what we said about how they're going to be... I'll just move them out of the way for a sec. Uh, we're going to pull the hammerers out of the way because we don't want them in our front line. Necessarily, if we don't have to. We'll spread our line pretty thin, like so. I'm going to throw my hammerers in the center. And then I'm going to throw Thanes on either corner like so I'll put my my two weaker lords there and then Belagar right here right here okay now beast do you remember where you want to put your positioning for you guys behind the arch is behind the main front line correct and what and what positions You've got four archers, so where should you put them? The main tankers, right at the back. Sorry? Right at the back between You got two sets of, you got two sets of lines here, front and back. You got the Well generally you have you have front, mid and, and back, but yeah. Um so do you remember well, where I we would placed put, put them right behind the the two in the so probably probably back there. here, yeah. That close. All right. Well, remember they've got to do a turn, right? So they'll turn that much. So about there is fine. So back a little bit from there. Hold on. And then probably there. And then you've got four archers here, so you'd probably throw another one here, and another one, well, back a little bit, probably there. So what we're going to be able to do now is exactly what we showed in the last one, where we can where we can have two archers now crossing across that way, firing across that way, and two archers firing across that way. Yeah? Yes. Now, why don't you go ahead and put these miners, see if you can hide them in the forest here. Yeah, I was just, I was just going to suggest that. Yeah, okay. Okay, so throw one around about, uh, probably put him there, actually. Hold on, I'm having trouble with the box again. Remember, just hold the right and and drag across. Yeah, but every time I drag across, it changes direction. There we go. Now that's better. 
So remember that the wherever you put wherever you put the arrow and you click right, that that will be the top left hand corner of the bot of the box that you're gonna draw out. Okay. Checking. All right, so maybe we change a little bit. Yeah, that's good. Yep, yeah, good, good. Maybe one here. You know the game better than I do. Are you happy one with there. that formation? No, not quite. We'll get rid of this guy. He's in the wrong place. And slightly change the rotation of this one here. Only because my OCD is playing up. <laughs> yeah, okay. He's probably a little bit close to that front line. You could probably pull him back. Out there. Yeah, this one's good. That one's good. Uh, this one, you could probably... it. No, you know, that's fine. That's fine. Just change this one. Just cross, like, sorry, about there. The one on the far left or the one in the middle? No, this one's left. fine. Change this one. So just right-click and drag the box out a little bit. So start the click here and drag that way. You'll get it. It just takes a bit of practice to get used to. Yeah, it does. No, not that one. This one. That's the one. Beautiful. One of them will be closer. Okay. Well, just straighten up your lines a little bit. Okay. That's fine. The rest is pretty good. Let's hit it up and start the battle. I've got to get him cross shooting. I remember okay. that. So we can straight away we can see. I'll slow this down for people, right? Um, straight away we can see that they have cavalry, right, sitting here on the flank. Now, if we have a quick look at the cavalry, now we should have looked at this in the screen as we were coming into the match. They have goblin cavalry, goblin wolf riders. So we should be able to shoot them down pretty quickly. They're they're only lightly armored. They have spears, which means they will be charging us. Yeah. Other than that, we got some orc boys. Mostly orc boys. We got a couple of goblins in the center here. We got some archers, and we'll need to be careful to take care of these guys quickly because they're the only things that can uh, that can really fire back at our ranged characters, right? So the only things of our line, the real damage dealers are here and our archers. Yeah, they're our damage dealers. The frontline oh, dwarves are, are basically, they're your shields, yeah? They're just going to hold the line. So your miners are going to get caught out. So I'd actually pull, I'd pull them back. Start pulling them back. I've been asking that for the last five minutes. That's all right. How far back? All the way back to the very back? Pull okay. them right back and then, and then drag them out here and use them as an extra defense against, um, yeah. So just pull them out yep, and done. drag them across there so that they add defense for your archer here. Yeah. You're right. They're on their way. Yeah, that's fine. If anything, they'll bait these guys in and we'll be able to get a couple of shots into them. All right. So double click okay. them to the lines and you'll be fine. Um, so what you're going to do here, Beast, is you're going to want to open up with this archer lot on here and this archer lot on here. Try and take them out. Just leave them going after those archers because as soon as they polish those archers off, there's no return fire. And as long as your archers are safe behind your lines, they can just keep pummeling the orc lines. These guys yep. here, uh, they basically going to take a priority target. So I would just be probably taking the orc boys. Ignore the, the goblins with spears. They're not your problem. So orc boys are a lot tougher, so I'd probably hit their front line. If you just leave... Yep. Excellent. They'll start shooting any second now. Now, if you just mouse over these archers, it'll actually show you a little yellow um, sort of outline. This shows you their range. Yeah. So just be careful that you don't click attack. Yeah, I, just made, I, just, I just made that mistake. Okay. Just as you said it. 
All right. Because they're out of range. They started moving, so I had okay. to pull them back. These guys here over on the right, they need to support your miners here because your miners are going to get eaten up. They're not very strong. So I would be having them fire on these guys. The line of sight isn't amazing, but let's hope you can at least provide some support there. Yeah. I oh, well, told the miners to go further than that. Have they been intercepted? They've been caught. That's fine. Um, yeah, so they're going, they're going. Now, something that you need to do, you need to click on each one of these archers and they'll be on skirmish mode, which what, which what that'll mean is they'll actually pull back. As soon as the orcs get too close, they'll run. So they'll stop shooting and run, which you don't actually want them to do, yeah? You okay. want them to keep firing. Right, so you need to click on each one of them, and if you notice down the bottom there, it'll have fire at will, and then they'll have skirmish mode. Unclick skirmish mode so it's not highlighted. This is something that new players quite often make a mistake with, and they've set all their lines up really lovely, and their archers are ready to go, and then all of a sudden their archers start running out, out of their lines for some reason. Okay, they're all unset. Okay. What that does mean, however, is you've got to pay attention to them because they won't run away. They'll just keep shooting. And then if something attacks them in melee, they'll just they'll just take them on yeah okay so your archers from here should be shooting into here you'll notice their archers are trying to take out your most valuable unit right your hammerers because they're going to do a lot of damage so these archers should be focus firing down here and here mm -hmm. these yeah, archers are providing support for these guys they've been caught out but your fire has pretty much all but routed those goblin wolf riders which is really good, right? So keep firing on them. You need to get rid of them. Once they're gone, yeah. it's going to be hard for stuff to get into your cookie jar on the back line here, okay? Yep. The, the dwarves will hold the line out. really, really well. Okay, now that you the... see what's coming up on the left? Yeah, I can see that. But they're goblins, so it's not too bad, right? Let's see what they do. They may just come in and attack your guys here, or they may try to come around. If you can have a look at them now, it looks like they're just going to come into the lines. Yeah. Your quarrelers are okay at fighting. They're not too bad. Your um, they're better. They'll be better at fighting than your rangers, I think. Um, now your you've got your oh. But, I've got my guys, I should say. We're going to roll our um, hammerers into the lines. Now that they these guys have taken the charge, the hammerers don't take the charge, and so they come in afterwards, and they can put out some serious damage. We're going to roll our lords in as well, because lords can put out some pretty damn sp damn nice damage. Even this guy will do... He'll do fine against... The archers are retreating. Should I change the archers' direction to the things that are attacking us? You definitely should. We're going to use our Lord to actually intercept these goblins. He'll even a, even a, um, a uh, ruined smith will be able to take out Someone's goblins. trying to come up behind us. That's all right. We've got the goblins. The ruined smith's going to take on the goblins. Okay. Supporting fire in there. That's good. Now, your archers, if you have a look at your archers here... They're in melee, yeah? I know, I'm pulling them back. So pull them out, face them that way, and shoot down this line to here. Okay? See how your Done. archers here have turned and their side is in the melee? Try and yeah. have them sit here and shoot down to this side, yeah? These guys, are, these guys are good. They're still supporting your miners over here, so that's fine, yeah? These guys here, you're moving, which is good. These guys here are firing down here. Have a like, pay attention to how much they're shooting. If they're only sending an odd bolt off here or there, their line of sight isn't great. And you probably need to either change yeah. them or do whatever. These guys are doing really well. Um, this is a cool tactic, especially for dwarves. Dwarves are extremely tanky, right? So you can just sit a lord in front and then have a whole archer brigade just shoot into a whole pack. They're not going to hit your lord, or your lord's not going to care either way, right? But Unlike having a whole bunch of units here, which your archers can't shoot past, a lord can be shot past really easily. So this is a great tactic for later on when you get Balagar or one of the lords up pretty high. They have huge defense. 
So you can just sort of sit him in the front and then just shoot in. Now just be careful when you get to, like, you're playing much higher levels like Legend and that. They won't survive that for very long. But on low levels, you know, um, we're playing on sort of beginner easy. But all the way up to very hard, it's a good tactic with the doors. So, um... Most of them are bolting. Yeah, they're breaking. The orcs have a low morale. The, the doors have very high morale. And these are chaff troops. So, shouldn't be too bad. Just leave your archers to keep firing. We'll pull our hammers back. We don't really want to get too far ahead. Actually, you know what we're going to do? We're going to fold in over here. So, you to remember what I told you about folding? Middle. Yes. Now, you don't want to do it just yet, right? Because we're not really sure... These guys, there's a good chance they'll turn. So this guy's already starting to turn here. He's starting to come back. He's, his uh, leadership bar or his morale bar is coming back on. So he's going to turn back. We're going to pull your Thane back. And we've, this Thane hasn't even done anything yet. We could probably throw this Thane in here, which we will. Arch is firing there. Arch is firing there. Cool. Hammerers are going to get into it here. My archer's picking on one of the generals since he's there by himself. Here right. they come. So this guy, these guys can move forward. What I'm being cautious of is just breaking my lines because of this. If I chased them all, my lines would be all over the place. Whereas here, I can, I have control, right? You've also got, we've got your um, miners up here that aren't doing anything, mate. You can send them across to here to support. There's nothing is going to be able to get years. around the back anymore. Yep. So I would send your miners over here. This side, you can see we've got some You're coming back in, but the archers should be able to take care of them. So watch your archers here on this side and put them on um, firing down here to get rid of any stragglers coming back. Hammerers are in there doing a good job. They're all in here. We need to support this uh, left flank, so we're going to send another... send two of these guys down here. We've got tons of um, supportive characters. We've got one here already who's pinning it down, our leadership here, and you can see the bar. So he's giving it plenty of leadership, plus dwarves have very high leadership, so you don't have to worry too much. So we'll throw our two melee lords into the combat here and try and relieve this side. I mean, it's fine, it's dwarves, but you would want to make sure that you're providing as much support as you can. Throw old Baligar in there as well. Archer fires pretty much taking care of the rest. Change your archer fire with these guys, mate. Yeah, I think you're already doing it, good. To this guy's here. Yep. Okay. These guys here have shattered. Change Archer Fire here into this incoming one here. Absolutely. I saw that. Blue and yep. hot. No, I could see you saw it. We're going to turn the hammerers and turn these guys around. Archers should be able to pick these guys off here. And they probably won't come, or if they do, they'll get shot to pieces anyway. These guys have a chance of coming back. That's why the Archer Fire is still good on them. Um, the Lord's just sitting there ready to go. And here they go. They've turned, but they're going to probably go again. Got the General. Okay. If we're having a look at their whole force, I can break my lines now because I can see where they're going. We're in a fight here. We're in a fight here. These, these guys here are free come across and support now and this guy can support too this is going to break so we don't have to worry about it and there's no other forces from here across these guys are shattered so they're not coming back these guys pretty much they're gone and even if they turn around they'll be able to deal with them so that's fine so i can move because i've cleared this section of my right flank i can then move these guys into support and waterfall over to them All right, so so these just as a side note, these retreating or can can they join up with some other faction and bolster their army? Uh, on the on the big map. I mean, they can technically they could um they could be um if you were chasing this army and it uh, confederated with a bigger um player or a bigger faction, it can do that. That can happen. Uh, but do you mean, can they technically, could they join another army to rebolse themselves? If it was a player... Yeah. Well, I mean, they can. Yes, they can. Um, the PC rarely does. But 
um, a player would. Oh, I'm out of ammo. Okay, that's cool. Just sit them at the back. And don't stress too much. Okay, so... It's a good timing. There's a few more coming. There's a couple more coming in from the left again. Fine. My archers on the attackers when they get in range. Okay, so swap these archers here to these guys. And they'll be able to shoot all of this yeah. incoming here. That's exactly what I was thinking. Beautiful. Turn I mean, around they're that. not a they're not a threat. We've got three lords here and a and a three quarter strike. Right, you might as well have your archers take out as much as possible. Okay, I so that's a shatter. They're all shattering now. You're starting to see it all they shatter. Are. And they've so all shattered. Them back. Yep, so that's it, we well, won. They all gave up, they're like, oh no, I'm out of here. Screw this. Alright, and that's a settlement battle, so we don't have to stress. I think that went rather well, actually. Hmm. Did very well. So um, MVP of the match, look here. Your Rangers did 118 kills. So if you actually have a look, right, the Hammers did well at 91 kills, but between all of your archers, they took out the majority of the army, yeah? Which is a good thing. Well, it's, that's what thing. they're there for, yeah? So you've got to think of your archers as glass cannons. Good use of your archers or your um, artillery... Your ranged abilities will get you the win most of the time. And really, especially with the dwarves, more than any other race, but really it's about protecting them long enough for them to be able to put that firepower out. Okay. Yeah. Like I was saying, this remainder of the army, could they just retreat to another lord or, or another faction and just become part of that army? Well, I mean, technically they could, mate, if if um, if they confederate. That's what I'm saying. They can confederate and they could do that, yes. Okay. So, um, but they, it, it rarely happens. Yeah. It rarely happens, yeah? So we've attacked this settlement, and I don't know if I went through it before. I probably did. You can occupy, and if you have a look down the bottom, it says conquest penalty. This is the public order penalty that will be applied to the province for the next turn only, right? And so you'll get a minus three to public order. Conquest penalty. So this is if I loot and then occupy it, I'll get a, a conquest penalty. This is a public order penalty that will be applied to the province for the next turn only. We will get that much gold out of it, right? And the province instability plus 10. This is the public order penalty that will be applied to the province deteriorating at one point per turn, right? So that's not good. And then if you sack it, you get a thousand gold, but you get that. Raise it means you destroy it and you get 310 gold. In this case, we're going to try to go for the province, so we're just going to occupy. Okay. And I'm pretty sure, yeah, we've just destroyed the faction broken node. So once you've taken out the very last base of a faction, they're gone. They're destroyed. Yeah. If they can't don't have any more bases, that's it. It's the end of them. They might have an army out on the field, um, but it'll slowly die, 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 and take attrition until it just it just whittles away, unless it can take another um settlement. Um so we've taken these now and we've got the same situation as I was explaining to Beast earlier or oh, in the last clip. Um we don't necessarily want this here because it only goes up to level three. And this, this settlement can go all the way up to level uh, five, right? So there'll be other things that we want to build in here that, that must go up to five or starts higher. So we don't necessarily want this. And also it doesn't cost that much to build. We have it in here and it goes to three. This one goes to three as well, right? The other thing is that upgrading your major settlement will happen slower than the little ones. The little ones don't need as much um, surplus, right? So population surplus to get to level three. So in order to get to the top rank of this and get the units that it gives us, we want to get these up quicker. So Zargzil isn't too bad. Karag um, uh, Bufdar is closer to us, to be fair, and therefore more defensible than this one. So, I mean, this is, um, it's already got it in there. So it's money you don't have to spend. However, ideally, as I would want to try and protect that as it's our ability to recruit 
um, troops, I would normally would like it in Carry Rifter instead. We're just going to leave it in there because this isn't a hard campaign. But if I was playing on hard, I'd actually swap them. Um, we are going to upgrade it pretty quickly so we can upgrade the troops. So this one's going to have the priority to upgrade. It's also furthest away from us, so we want to get its defenses up as quickly as we can. Cool. Um, we're going to click on this one and we're going to destroy that one. That'll take a turn, and then on the next turn, we'll be able to put something else there of more value. Now, this only has two, and you're thinking, okay, so why then not put it in here? Special buildings like this, these pink buildings, are, can only be built in certain settlements. So it doesn't mean it can be built anywhere. It can only be built in here. Sometimes they happen in little settlements, but most of the time you'll see these special buildings only in the larger settlements. Cool, and that's about it. So we're, we've just done, we've just on an hour and five minutes beastie so we'll probably call it in about 10 15 minutes if that's okay with you yeah, yeah um, sure and i'll have to break this one up into two episodes so um guys here when you see these little okay when you see these little yellow triangle next to your uh, army that means that one of your lords has an upgrade in this case all of them do right and so we click on Baliga and we can see he has a little yellow icon telling us that there's an upgrade here. Now, we have his upgrade tree that we talked about in the first ones. Um, now, this is the top line. These are quite often special and unique to the character. So ability, Mighty Oathstone. Uh, it's augment. It instantly affects target area. 25 self-afflicted allies. 40 meter range, 27 melee defense, expert charge defense. So this basically ups the defense of everybody around me in a 40 meter radius, which is pretty strong. That's a pretty strong ability. We're going to go with inspired character or leadership. Actually, no, we won't. Yeah, we will. All right, that's fine. I did it anyway. Um, now, these guys are like... This guy is a Ruinsmith. So we're going to keep him in our army because the Ruinsmiths are really good at buffing. They're a buffing character. So he'll stay in the army. So we'll want to work on his Ruin abilities here. So there we go. Um, this is the Thane. So the Thane we probably will use as a um, probably more... Actually, we might keep him. We'll keep one for training purposes, and one we'll put as an assassin. So this one we'll do as our trainer, and so we'll leave him in. Now this thing we're going to have as an assassin. So um, we're going to go down to special abilities, and this is really important. If you're going to use these guys as an agent, this is one of the ones you want to do first because it actually reduces the cost of agent actions by nearly half, which is really important because it can be very expensive to do agent actions. I'll talk more about agent actions as we go forward. Um, the other one I'm going to keep here is our um, Master Engineer because these guys are awesome. Um, if you have a look here, he has an ability that ups the accuracy and the, re and the reload skill of anybody around him. So this includes archers and... Um, Pardon me, and uh, artillery pieces. So really good to have buffing your back lines and uh, well worth it. So look at the, the different skills that they give and make sure you're putting it, you're using the right agents to severely buff or your army and debuff the other army. So this guy here, we were going to turn into the assassin. So let's pull him out of our army straight away. He's out. So we'll use him to harass other generals to cause havoc and mayhem, basically. Um, it's also, being an agent is a good way of upgrading their skills very quickly. Okay. Now, it's saying that we have something here. Resolve or skip this notification. So it's saying that we have now just got our first province. And I can now choose one of the um, upgrades, basically, for owning a province. So I've got untainted plus one, untainted plus one, and public order plus two. We have a minus public order here. We can see that's not going to fix it, right? Tax rate, you might go, oh, more money, great, but it's only five percent, and not much point in getting the money if you can't grow. And you'll notice that I said to you before that the dwarves are very slow to get population. Surplus population is very slow for them. 
So you kind of want to make sure that you are focused on that. This is my opinion, of course. Other people take it differently. Also, additional trading resources allows me to basically trade more and make more money. The next one is construction. So this is also a good one to use early on because you're going to be recruiting troops in this province and you're going to be doing a lot of construction. So 10% off every building you do is also pretty good. I would choose between the two of these and then late game once you've built in here, then look at these two, yeah? Um, this one, I almost, unless you're in trouble and you're really having problems, I don't usually use this. I would use this late game to just get more money once I've built everything and I don't really need to worry about things. Um, this is sort of early to start and then this is as you get into your growing phases. Um, personally, I prefer this because 15% growth is just, in my opinion, better than a 10% reduction in costs. Um, so with that, my turn has ended and we'll move over to Beastie. All right, my technology's been done. Yeah, cool. So you probably get to choose another one now then. Mm. I got to think which one I'm going to go for. And it looks like you've got, what have you got? You've got four frontliners, five frontliners. You still only got the two archers here, but you've got the grudge throw as well. So that's cool. So what are you going to do with your army next? I'm just looking at my technology at the moment. Mm -hmm. Something, yep, I've chosen something. Okay. Oh, runny nose. My apologies. Broken nose running. destroyed. Nice one. Okay, that's it. My turn's finished. Okay. Speed up the term timer a little bit. So have you got any questions so far, Beast, or are you sort of getting a feel for all of it? No, I'm going to understand. Yeah, I'm all right. Okay, cool. If I think of anything, I'll definitely ask. <laughs> no problem. So keep an eye on this map up here, guys, as you're playing, um, because things can change fairly quickly without you realizing it turn to turn. Maps can, the map can change very dramatically. You kind of want to know what's happening around you. Um, remember that when you actually get an alliance with somebody, you actually open up all, so say this is a fogged area, right? Well, it is a fogged area. This is a fogged area, right? So we can see the areas that we can immediately, we've either traveled in. So if I travel down here, I'll open up this area. Or if an ally, a, a military ally has traveled down there, then I'll be able to see it. So if you get a military alliance with somebody, you not only open up their map, but also any military alliances they have and any knowledge they have. So you gain all of their map awareness. So if they travel up here, you gain it. So as you can see, I'm down here, but because I have, um, I've got something with the empire, I'm able to see their or certain parts of their area. Okay, I got diplomacy that came up again. What does Zufa want? It's for Brandon Stoneheart. He wants. They're the man's military access. And their offers is military access. Right. So what he's saying mean? military access means that they can come onto your prop, your lands, and you can go onto their lands. This is just the next oh. step in good relations with them. So I'd that's say yes. that's a yes. Yeah. yeah. I wanted to ask before I did it to make sure. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. So yeah. So if anyone goes onto your land that's not friendly, they get attrition like you said last time correct well no 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 they only get attrition if they're not used to that particular landscape so like for some factions they're not very good in the mountains because it's too snowy right so they get attrition yeah. we're dwarves so we don't get that but if say um if humans if the empire goes up in the mountains they will get attrition yeah 
Okay. Um, but if they yeah. go onto your land, then you'll have a penalty, a, a diplomatic penalty, right, with them. Uh, okay, so I can now, because I've freed this up, right, I can now open up and do something that's probably a little bit more valuable to me. Um, so if you, when you're opening up to a thing, there's, there, you should see, there's always going to be those four, right? There's going to be a red, red one with a hammer on it, or it'll change, the pictures will change depending on the faction, right? But the first one will be the red one, whatever the picture is, doesn't matter. This is your military recruitment. And these are all the different buildings in the military. The second one will be your purple one. And these, these are military support. So these will be all your special buildings that will give you special bonuses and bits and pieces. They're usually the most expensive, by the way, and they're usually the ones you want to try and put into your larger settlements. This, the third one, which is gold, is your defensive. So these will be gates, generally, or walls for your settlements. Um, these are important, and you should get them fairly early on if you can afford them. Now, the last one is your infrastructure. Now, these things are, you know, they'll give you either growth, as you can see here, casualty replenishment rate and growth. So that's important for doors. The second one is the trinket, the trinket maker. And right up to the top of Toolmaker's Guild Hall. So at the top here, we're going to get 600 income from this. And if you were paying attention before, income from Toolmaker's plus five. Yeah. So that then, every one of those buildings you get, it ups it. And there is a second one somewhere as well. There's an income from Toolmaker's plus 10, I believe. There we go. Above it, you can go plus 10% for all. So do pay attention to what you're putting in and try to plan your building a little bit like I was saying before. In this case, we're early on, right? I could probably put the defensive part here, but then it's going to sort of limit me a little bit. If I have a look and I go, okay, well, if I... If I build the siege workshop, then I can actually build bolt throwers and I can build grudge throwers, which would be nice. And eventually I can get cannons and thunderers, which are ha which are handguns or gunners. Really, really, really good. Also, all the really cool toys are up the top here in this line. So it's something to remember. Here I'll get thanes, iron breakers, and hammerers. Now, I've already got a pair of hammerers. Iron breakers are very high-end, high tier. So we're not going to have them for a while, so we shouldn't worry. Also, your main building chain must be at level four before you'll get access to that. Right now, we're at level two, so it'll only open up to these two here. Um, right now, we have access if we go to if we go to our lord. We can recruit right now. All right, so right now we can recruit these two guys. Yeah, can't recruit anybody else. We have some archers which we can which we will be able to recruit again once we get this building to level two we remember we had it level two here but we moved it so now we're it's only at level one so we can only recruit these guys so we'll get the archers back in a bit and then we'll move up to these ones we also get a thane up here so i mean dictate you would probably get this one here um, and allow yourself to get some bolt throwers. This gives you armor piercing missiles and anti large. So, um, cavalry, giants, all that sort of stuff. This is going to be able to deal with it. You could also go here and get yourself another version of archers, like we talked about in the first lesson. Um, not the first lesson, the first, <laughs> the, uh, the first episode. Now, these ones here, this is one I was talking about beast. So, this is the last tab in the green section. And you come up here and there's a pic picture here of a keg and it says refractory hostillery. So this gives us dwarf beer resource production, six kegs. That means that's something that we can trade. So if we're trading with anybody, we'll make money from trading those beer kegs. It also gives us five public order bonus. You'll also notice that it starts at level two and it goes all the way to level five. So it's, it's quite good. It'll give you public order plus 12 and 12 beer kegs. This is a good one early on because you'll notice we're okay now but as soon as i pull my army out of here and start going and tackling other things i'm going to start to have issues and problems um what i am going to do however is i'm going to go i'm going to go growth um because i want to get that that 38 percent growth um early on now you can put them in here but they're only going to get to level three 
to give you a 30% growth, which isn't too bad, but it's not the same. I mean, I probably actually, I probably will leave it there. And I'll probably go, yeah, I'll probably go this one. So these two here, you probably want in this main settlement, but these two, but pardon me, these two, you can have into the main settlement and you can see that it'll get you 600 or at level three, it'll get you 400. So you get another 200 for putting in main settlement, but then you lose a position in here. So I actually won't do that. My apologies. This uh, gives us oath gold. It gives income for trade. And at the top, it gives us plus five for trade, additional tradable resources, income from all buildings. So this is a good one to have. Um, but let's fix our public order issues first and get them under wraps. Cool. We've already got a growth building in here, so that'll keep going. And then we'll be able to put a couple of extra ones in here. But let's get that keg and get that public order sword. Now, if your public order gets to 100 in the negative, you'll have a rebellion and that's a pain in the bum. So try not to try to avoid public orders going up and up and up and up and up. So down here now, I don't think we need any extra troops. We're sitting okay where we are. Um, what I'm going to want to do is start moving into the orc realms. Now, Carrick Hearn's done all right here. We don't really need to play with him. And these guys are okay. I probably want to come down here and start having a bit of a, a fight out here. Maybe try and take something here. So what we're going to do here is we're going to open up the menu here. And we're going to have to move through um, this guy's lands here. Yeah, so the Border Prince's lands. So we're going to have a look at the border prince. We're going to go, okay, he likes us. We have a non-aggression pact, but we don't have permission to go into his territory. So let's go up and have a look. So military access. So their success is, is very low. All right, let's sweeten the deal a little bit for him. So we'll offer a payment. Okay, still very low. So he's not going to like that. So we will get, even though it's green, he's still not wanting to trade with us just yet. Tilia and the Border Princes are notoriously difficult to deal with, so just be aware of that. Is there anybody else that, no, we don't have anybody else. Okay. So what we're gonna do here, we're gonna go underway. Um, if we were to not use the underway, I actually have to go around the mountains. Using the underway, I get to go under them, which is really cool. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to shoot to here and then on the next turn, I'm going to come over to here. I, what I really want is to try and take something here because our ultimate target is to get over here to Carrigate Peaks. Um, ideally, something over here would be good. So what we might do is move to here right on the edge, but not in his territory. So we're just outside his territory, right? As soon as we go in there, we'll get a negative to our diplomatic status with him. From there, we're gonna move across here and then across here. Hopefully there's no army here. This has a port, which is also nice. And we're gonna take that and then try and take um, Tok, uh, Dok Karaz. Cool, all right, let's, uh, let's move on to the next turn. Oh, this is our um, little agent as well. I'm actually gonna pop him. I'm actually gonna move him up here so that if any armies come in, he can harass them and give us time to get back. All right, Beast, you're up. Yep. Are we done? Uh, yeah, we should probably end it there, yeah. I'll break I'm it into two I'm episodes. very tired. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no worries, mate. All right, Um, yeah, we'll end it there. Thank you very much for watching, guys. As always, I hope you've learned something. I hope it wasn't too boring. Um, The second one, we had, only had the one battle. Uh, early on, you're just sort of consolidating and trying to build yourself up. So we will get more battles as we come through into the later levels. Um, and that's really about it. I hope you've learned something. I hope you had a bit of fun with it and it's not too boring. Uh, otherwise, uh, make sure that you check all the links down below. Or if you're watching on YouTube, then check it in the about page for all the different... Uh, we've got Instagram and Twitter and Twitch and all those sort of things. Um, outside of that, Beastie, you want to say goodbye? Goodbye, all. All right, no worries. Uh, I'll see you on the next episode of Dog Shadow Gaming. See ya. Bye. Yeah, yeah.